بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أحسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار In the previous lesson we looked at five benefits or five lessons that are to be taken from the passage in Surah Al-Baqarah that Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala alluded to in his fourth principle the principle that relates to knowledge of knowing knowledge having uh, understanding of what is knowledge and who are the scholars and what is fiqh understanding and who are the fuqaha who are the scholars who understand the uh, knowledge and the sharia and the rulings so uh, this was the uh, general principle and he said that we distinguish between this category of people the scholars and the fuqaha from those people who try to resemble them but are not really from them and he explains that this principle has been explained in detail at the beginning of surah al-baqarah and then the shaykh alludes to a passage of verses from the Quran that relate to the Bani Israel and so in the previous lesson the Sheikh mentioned that the entire lengthy passage which consists of around 80 verses in Surah Al-Baqarah that within that lengthy passage is an illustration of this principle and many of the issues which are connected to it and so the Sheikh explained that we will draw out some of those lessons and benefits. And so in the previous lesson we looked at five of them. And those five benefits were as follows. Number one, a reminder of the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon Bani, Bani Israel in particular. And this being... Uh, to address the Jews who were present in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to recount Allah's favor upon their ancestors and you know the, the great bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, upon them the second issue that was raised by the sheikh was the fact that in these verses is an indication of the disgraces of the Bani Israel and how they behaved with their prophets and messengers, their prophets, and that this is a warning to this ummah not to behave in the same way. And we therefore see that when you look at the behavior of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum towards the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and how they honored and respected him, you see a sharp contrast between that and between the way the Bani Israel used to treat their prophets. And that, of course, is because the companions of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, took heed of and were cultivated by that which Allah revealed upon the Prophet Muhammad, sallam, and in particular these types of lessons in Surah Al-Baqarah about the ways of those people who came before. The third lesson that was uh, mentioned was the issue of concealing the truth, concealing the truth, because this was a trait of Bani Israel and this indicates that the obligation upon the scholars is to explain the truth with wisdom and not to conceal the knowledge and also that concealing the knowledge knowing that people are in need of it is from the traits and characteristics of the Yahud and so this indicates that this is not from the qualities of the scholars, from the ulama or the fuqaha. And in fact, all of these issues, uh, being grateful for the favors of Allah and being respectful to the prophets and the people of knowledge and being free of the disgraces of the nations of, of the past, 
and likewise not concealing the knowledge. All of these are from the qualities of the true scholars, the true fuqaha. The fourth lesson was the issue of envy, al-hasad, and the fact that many of the Yahud, the tribes of the Yahud, uh, and likewise the Christians, that they were anticipating a prophet because they moved to Medina and because they were overwhelmed by the Arabs they would boast and say that when this prophet comes then he will give then we will receive victory and dominate you but when this prophet came and he turned to be from the lineage of the Arabs then they fell into envy al-hasad and this prevented them from accepting the truth and even though they knew that this was indeed the messenger mentioned in their own books in the Torah but they still denied and rejected the truth so this is not from the traits of the people of knowledge to reject the truth or to know the falsehood and to defend the falsehood this is from the ways who pretend to be the people of knowledge but are not from them and the fifth issue that the Sheikh mentioned was the issue of abrogation and naskh which is something that the Sharia of Islam establishes and this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislates what is in the beneficial interests of his servants so at a time he may legislate something and at another time he may legislate something to replace it and all of that is to is all of that is for the beneficial interests of the servants and this was something that was rejected by the Yahud because they would say how come the messenger commands one thing and then he changes it and they would use this as a, as a means of argument and a rejection uh, and, and use this to find fault with uh, the call of the messenger وسلم. so this was rejected in an ayah in which Allah explained that we do not cause a verse to be abrogated or forgotten or left except that we bring that which is better than it or like it and so this establishes that abrogation is, uh, is something that is, is part and parcel of the Sharia and that Allah legislates whatever He wills and He legislates for the beneficial interests of His servants. So this was the fifth point and now we'll continue our discussion inshallah ta'ala and we'll make this lesson brief and short today because I understand that the uh, prayer for Asr is in roughly 20 to 25 minutes so inshallah the lesson today will be with, will be uh, 20 minutes or so inshallah ta'ala so the sixth benefit that we take from this passage in surah al-baqarah is from the statement of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala walillahi al-mashriq wal maghrib fa ayna ma tawallu fa thamma wajhu allah inna allah wasi'un alim Allah says to Allah walillahi al-mashriq wal maghrib to Allah belongs the east and the west so wherever you turn then you will find the countenance of Allah indeed Allah is vast and all knowing he's very uh, vast in generosity and all knowing now this ayah this specific ayah that the shaykh has mentioned he says there are two benefits that we can take from this ayah the first ayah is to establish the attribute of face for Allah the mighty and majestic and this ayah as explained by Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala is an ayah that is used by some of the innovators to deny the attribute of face because they try to make ta'wil and they say that this ayah really is speaking about that wherever you may turn you will find the uh, presence or the you know the, the 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 countenance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it does not refer to the actual face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now ibn al-qayyim he addresses this argument and he says that this is one of those verses in which both meanings are comprised together at one and the same time no doubt there are other other verses like in uh, surah ar-rahman in surah ar-rahman where the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly mentioned and ascribed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and other verses as well but in this particular verse it is a verse that actually comprises two meanings at one and the same time 
So the shaykh says here though that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though we affirm this attribute of face as indicated in this ayah we do not ask how this face is we do not have any further knowledge about this face we don't uh, you know, pursue this matter further we simply believe in all of his attributes we don't say how is his face or how is his hand or how you know we don't ask how for any of his attributes because the companions and whoever came after them from Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah they believe in all of the attributes as a, as a uniform principle, as a general principle. Whatever has come in the Quran and the Sunnah, they have a single, uniform, consistent principle for everything, which is to affirm what Allah affirms for Himself and what His Messenger affirms for Him, and to deny any likeness, and to deny, uh, uh, you know, and to uh, avoid asking how. So we don't make any tamthil, nor do we make any takyif. There is no lightning, and there is no asking how or delving into the reality of the attributes. And so we see the companions of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they never investigated and sought out the uh, kayfiyya, the reality of the attributes. Rather, they would leave this knowledge to Allah subhanahu. Wata'ala. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we find that he did not describe the face of Allah, he did not describe the hand of Allah, he did not describe any of the uh, attributes uh, in order to reveal their kafir because that knowledge has not been given or revealed and it is not something that we are able to, to grasp and understand. So this is the first principle. This is the uh, attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we take from this ayah. And in this, there's also another point to be made, which is that when we look at the people being spoken of in this passage as a whole, who are the Yahud, we find that from the ways that they followed, was that they, follow, was that they entered into tashbih, a type of resemblance and um, you know, a type of tamthil in that they began to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with many of the defects of the creation. So they fell into a type of tashbih. And so, therefore, you see in the Torah, if you were to read, uh, when we look in the Torah, we see many gross and evil uh, ascriptions they make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that the, that the nation of the Jews fell into. So the Sharia of Islam. Is, uh, came to uh, remove all of these false descriptions and false ascriptions to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to establish that there is nothing which is like him or which, which, re which resembles him rather uh, as we see in the, Quran, uh, in the, in the verse in uh, the Quran لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ There is nothing which is a likeness to him and he's all, all uh, hearing and all uh, seeing the second ruling that we take from this ayah, that the same ayah contains, is that when a Muslim is upon a riding vessel, a means of transport, be that a animal, a horse, a camel, a donkey, whatever it might be, or even a manufactured and engineered means of transport, then if he is praying the nafal prayer, the uh, voluntary prayer, then his qibla is wherever wherever he is facing. So in whichever direction his riding beast turns, or in whichever direction the car or the aeroplane or the ship or whatever else, whichever way it turns, then this is his qibla. This is his direction of prayer. And this is from the bounty and the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are two benefits from this ayah, and this is the sixth benefit that the shaykh mentions. The seventh benefit that the Shaykh mentions is regarding the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَن تَرْضَى عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَرَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ Which means that, you, that, that the Yahud and the Nasara, the Jews and the Christians, they will never be pleased with you up until you follow their millah, up until you follow their religion. And so here the Sheikh says this is an explanation of the severe enmity, uh, animosity that these two groups harbor uh, towards the Muslimin. 
in that they will not be pleased with a Muslim, they will not leave a Muslim alone up until he follows their deen, he follows their way. And here the Shaykh says another question arises which is, is it permissible for a Muslim to benefit from the Jews and the Christians in the matters of the world, in the worldly affairs? And the answer to that is, of course, yes, it is permissible. And uh, there, are, there are dealings and transactions which are permissible between Muslims and non-Muslims, and amongst them are the Jews and the Christians. And alongside that, we keep in mind the fact that they have an animosity uh, towards the Muslims and wish for them to be taken away from the religion. So with this caution, along with this caution, we are still permitted to uh, deal with them and to uh, transact uh, with them and you know a benefit in the worldly affairs so things such as uh, can we take uh, you know certain types of knowledge from them the types of worldly knowledge to do with uh, manufacturing and the various worldly sciences and like us co uh, cooperation with them and purchasing things which are of interest from them and even seeking aid from them in matters of uh, in you know in in political issues when it comes to defense of the country and to war, to uh, ward off a, a enemy, an aggressive enemy. So all of these things are permitted and indicated in the Sunnah, uh, which is established from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this is the seventh benefit that the Sheikh mentions, and then he says after this that these are only some of the uh, rulings that we extracted, although there are very, very many in this lengthy passage of 80 or so verses. The Sheikh says, the way of the people of knowledge is that they are the people who understand and derive these lessons. And as for the people of misguidance, are the people who uh, claim to be scholars, but not, they are not from the scholars, then they conceal the, the truth, they mix the truth with falsehood, they conceal the knowledge and Whatever has been mentioned in these verses explains the traits and characteristics of these people who are not from the, uh, from the scholars, but who pretend to be from amongst them. So after this, the Sheikh says that in the second half of this principle, Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah ta'ala, he explains that many of the people of falsehood, they attack the people of knowledge. And they claim that the people of knowledge, that they are upon zandaqa, they are upon uh, heresy, or that they are mad. In other words, because they speak the truth, and because they don't speak with bid'ah, with, with, you know, with innovations and things of, that, things of that nature, because they stick to knowledge and fiqh, then you find that many of the people of Batil, they label them with derogatory names and labels, that this is a, a, a reality. So the Sheikh says that this is what the Sheikh has mentioned and the Sheikh says that this is something that in our time we also see. We see that against the people of Salafiyya, against the callers to Salafiyya, the carriers of this knowledge and fiqh, we see that there are expressions used against them that ascribe ignorance to them. For example, in the distant past, in the early uh, history of Islam, we see that the people of Kalam, Ilmul Kalam, they used to say, Tariqatul Salaf, Aslam, wa Tariqatul Khalaf, A'lam, wa Ahkam. This is a, a phrase they used to say. They used to say that the path of the Salaf is safer. However, the path of the Khalaf, those who came after, it is more knowledgeable, more, uh, more knowledgeable, and more precise. And what they meant to say by this was, that the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum did not really understand the verses in the Qur'an that relate to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore they remained silent about them. However, the later people who came, they mean here the Ash'aris and the Maturidis and the Ahlul Kalam and so on and so forth, that their way was more knowledgeable and more precise. Why? Because they claim they truly understood the verses of the attributes, they made ta'wil of them, 
and so on and so forth. And so they claimed that their knowledge was more precise and more exact. This means that this was a, a, a revilement and an attack upon the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the Tabi'een and the Tabi Tabi'een. And this is an example of how they ascribed ignorance and how they reviled the true and real people of knowledge of ilm and of fiqh. Now using that as an example, the Shaykh moves on to say that in our time likewise, there have appeared numerous people who have started using certain terms and expressions and they say for example that the scholars, meaning the scholars of Salafiyya and Sunnah, they are just scholars of the of the rulings, of the ahkam, of the sharia. They don't really understand the, the uh, current affairs. Or they say that these scholars, these scholars, they are only scholars of the rulings pertaining to women's menstruation or the rulings pertaining to the uh, you know the postpartum bleeding after a woman has delivered uh, the rulings pertaining to the uh, the bleeding thereafter and the issues of purification so this is how they portray the scholars they treat them as if their knowledge is limited only to the real rulings pertaining to women's issues and this really is the the intent behind it is to revile them and to ridicule their knowledge and make the youth to turn away from them and to distrust their knowledge. And the people who make the likes of this claim, although the Sheikh doesn't mention their names, it is clear from history who these people are. People like Salman al Awda and uh, Abdul Rahman Abdul Khaliq and likewise Safar al Hawali and all these people who are from the Ikhwanis who came to the Salafis. Uh, trying to spread the doctrines of Sayyid Qutb and Hasl al-Banna and faking ascription to Salafiyya and then uh, attacking the scholars, reviling the scholars and rousing the youth against the scholars. These are the people who are making the likes of these evil and vile statements. Now on top of this, on top of attacking the scholars of the Sunnah, they would also promote the statements of the people of Bid'ah and the books of the people of Bid'ah. So we see, and these are the heads of misguidance in the 20th century. People like Hassan al-Turabi, the man from Sudan, who denies and rejects the, 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 the Sunnah. And people like Abu A'la al-Mawdudi, that man from Pakistan, who is a very close friend of uh, the, 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 the fake Ayatollah, who is really the Ayat al-Shaytan, uh, al-Khomeini, that perishing Khomeini. The Rafidi Shi'i, and likewise people like Muhammad Al Ghazali, who is also an Ikhwani. So they come, on the one hand, they attack and revile the scholars, and on the other hand, they praise the people of Bid'ah and Dalala. And this indicates that these people are not from the people of Fiqh, nor from the people of, 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 of Ilm, rather, they are from the people of uh, innovation and desires, and they attack the people of knowledge. Now, the Sheikh here, he gives three examples from each of these three individuals from Hassan al-Turabi and al-Mawdudi and al-Ghazali he gives three examples of their statements I'll, I'll quickly summarize each of their statements as for Hassan al-Turabi who is from Sudan then we find in his statements he basically has revilements and he speaks ill of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam likewise he also claims and says that the reason for the backwardness of Muslim societies is because they do not allow the free mixing and intermingling of men and women. And these are some of his statements. And likewise, Al Maududi, he claims and he says that the Surah uh, An Nasr, Ida Jaa Nasrullahi wal Fatih wa Ra'it al Nasa Yadukhuluna fi din lahi fuwaja, fasabbih bihamdi rabbika wa staghfirh. He says that this surah in which Allah commands the messenger of Allah to make istighfar, he says this surah was revealed because the messenger of Allah had shortcomings in fulfilling the obligations of his prophethood. This is a revilement upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And likewise Al-Ghazali who is the third person, we find him um, praising the Shia 
and claiming that the Shia that the difference between the Shia and the Sunni is just like the differences between the schools of fiqh so a person may be a Hanbali or a Maliki or a Shafi'i and the differences between the Sunnah and the Shia are similar to the differences between the schools of fiqh and he says the realities are the same between them it's just that the ways and means are different so these are some of the statements that come from Muhammad al-Ghazali you can see that all of these three are misguided and misguiding individuals they are from the heads of innovation but the point being that there is a group of people who appeared like Salman al-Awda Safar al-Hawali Abdul Rahman Abdul Khalik that they began to revile the scholars of Salafiya whilst promoting the books of the likes of these people and this indicates their great uh, misguidance and the fact that they are upon bid'ah and dalala and that they are followers of desires and then the Sheikh finishes with a statement from Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah ta which explains the reality of these people and with this we can conclude our lesson today so the statement of Sheikh al-Islam is as occurs in Majmu' al-Fatawa he says he's speaking about two groups of people one group of people who fall into takfir they make takfir of people in falsehood and then he says that alongside these people who make takfir in batil there is, there is another group of people لا يعرفون اعتقاد أهل السنة اعتقاد أهل السنة والجماعة they do not know they do not know the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah as it truly should be known. Or they might know some of it and they may be ignorant of other parts of it. And then the part of it which they know of the truth, of meaning of the creed of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they do not explain it to the people, rather they conceal it. And nor do they prohibit from those innovations which are opposed to the book and the Sunnah nor do they rebuke and revile the people of innovations or punish them rather they may even criticize speech about the sunnah and about the foundations of the religion absolutely meaning that they dislike speech about the the usul the foundations of aqidah and manhaj and so on so forth. They, don't, they don't like speech about these issues yet on the other hand they don't prohibit the innovations which oppose from the book and the sunnah so the Shaykh continues and he says, and they do not distinguish between what the book and the sunnah and consensus have indicated and between what is said by those people of innovation and misguidance. Or what they might do is they might affirm everybody, accept everybody's sayings, all the different madhahib, all the different schools, they might affirm them and accept them all, just like the scholars might accept the rulings of the scholars which are based upon ijtihad, which are based upon permissible type of ijtihad. This is how they treat the differences between the sunnah and the bid'ah. They treat them to be as if they are permissible ijtihads that the scholars sometimes make in, in issues of ijtihad, in permissible ijtihad. So the shaykh says that this is a way and a path that has overcome many of the murji'ah, many of the murji'ah, and likewise some of the those who claim to be jurists and some of those who are from the, the Sufis and some of those who follow the ways of the philosophers so here in this statement of Shaykh al-Islam we see that he uh, described a group of people like this in history who, have, who were like this that on the one hand they detest and hate speech about the usul, about the aqidah, about the manhaj they don't want these issues to be clarified and on the other hand you find them accommodating the people of bid'ah and not clarifying the truth and disliking speak, uh, speech about them and so on and so forth and these are the people that Sheikh Obeid alluded to in our time uh, like those Qutbiyya Ikhwani that we mentioned they are the ones who carry this way and this path and in fact there are other people in the west that carry the same trait and characteristic you see people like Yasser Qadi and uh, other uh, uh, innovators and deviants you see them accommodating and opening up arms to the Jahmiyyah uh, and even now, even until even the Shia you see there are indications in the actions of this man of Yasir Qadi that he wants to extend uh, what he did uh, many years back with the Sufiya 
he, he there are clear signs that he wants to extend that and include the Shia in that as well, as indicated uh, in his uh, lectures in the Isna conference on the 1st of September earlier this year. So this is an evil man. At the same time, you see him criticizing and mocking and rebuking, rebuking uh, the Salafi, Salafis and their scholars uh, as well. And there are many of these types of people in the uh, West. So with that, we conclude uh, today's lesson. This concludes our discussion of the fourth principle from the speech of Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabri, Hafizullah Ta'ala. So in the next lesson, inshallah Ta'ala, we will begin with the uh, commentary of Sheikh Zaid al-Madkhali, inshallah Ta'ala. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.